Hi everyone! Today I'm going to be talking about sewing with faux leather or as it's also known PU. So this is going to be a handy guide for anyone who hasn't tried sewing with PU before or perhaps would just like an easier time sewing with it. So I've got lots of hints and tips and actually I'm answering lots of questions which have been requested from you. So I went onto Facebook and I asked you what sort of things would you like me to cover in a sewing with PU video and this is the list that we've come up with. So um, I'll try and run through them at a reasonable speed but do forgive me if this guide is well on the long side because there were lots of questions. Um, the first thing that I do want to say about sewing with PU is this is all about sewing with PU on your domestic sewing machine, your home sewing machine. Now, I know that some of you do have industrial machines, which is fabulous, um, but most of us don't. So I wanted to dispel any fears that if you own a domestic sewing machine and you might be thinking, oh, no, no, PU is not for me. It's just going to be a little bit hardcore. I'm here to tell you that it absolutely isn't provided you ensure a few things and hopefully you can follow these tips and tricks. So the first thing that you need to ensure is that when you buy your PU, that when you're buying it, it is home sewing machine friendly. By that I mean it's not monstrously thick uh, because we need to we need to minimise bulk wherever we can in our home sewing and also that the th fabric isn't too thin um, you can buy thinner PUs, which they do look nice, but then you do need to end up adding interfacing to them always. Uh, and if you don't, then you don't want things like your keys or any sharp objects to easily pierce through the fabric. So even though you want the fabric to be thin, you don't want it to be fragile either. And the last thing is you want to make sure that it's not sticky. So when I say sticky, you don't want the right side of the surface to either be able to stick to the bed of your sewing machine or stick your foot because stickiness is one thing that creates nightmare slipped stitches and I'll talk about that more in a minute. So what does home sewing machine friendly PU look like? Well uh, unsurprisingly that is the only kind of PU that I stock. It's home sewing machine friendly because it doesn't stick it doesn't stick to the bed of your machine and it the foot doesn't stick to it either it's a matte surface and it's easily slippery enough to glide through your machine and glide under the machine foot so that really does take a lot of the stress away um, it's thin enough that you can easily fold it into four layers and stitch through it without any issues so it's important when you're bag making to be able to stitch your PU into four layers because that's often the ideal number of layers to make a good strong PU strap. Uh, and at the end of the video, I'll stitch through the four layers and just prove it to you that my PU is easy to fold into four and to stitch through. Um, it's got a great strength to weight ratio. So when I say weight, I just cover that just now. It's thin. It's thin, but it's strong enough. It's strong enough because you can absolutely sew with this PU to make a bag and you don't have to put interfacing on the back side of it to strengthen it. Now, if you were making, say, a whole door or maybe a gadget case, then yes, in instances like that, I would probably iron some interfacing to the back of my bag. But I've got a largish bag here and that's made from the grey PU that we stock and the, uh, the base doesn't have any interfacing stuck on the wrong side it's plenty strong enough I have put interfacing on the lock part because the lock part is supporting this heavy metal lock so the only times usually that I put interfacing on the back of my PU is when I'm adding interfacings to the area or my bag is going to be super heavy duty or I need it to protect something like a laptop. So it's strong enough as is. 
yet it isn't really thick and bulky. And lastly, all my PUs have a knitted backing. Now, a knitted backing is really nice because it helps give the PU lovely drape and it's really, really nice for ironing interfacings on the wrong side too, if that's what you need to do. So, Home Sewing Machine Friendly PU is not sticky. It's thin, yet strong. You don't necessarily need to iron interfacing on it, but should you need to, it's got a nice, stable knitted backing, which is great for drape and great for ironing interfacing on too. Now I stock over 20 colours of yummy home sewing machine for any PU. I stock matte colours like this, loads of colours, and also stock some rather gorgeous foil colours too. So even this shiny foil blue will not stick to the bed of your machine and the machine foot doesn't stick to it either. It's fabulous. You guys all love it. Okay, so that, that's buying. So buying the right PU really does make your life a lot easier. When buying PU yourself, try asking the stockist, can I fold this into four and stitch it on my home sewing machine easily? So that way you're going to find out if it's too thick for your home sewing machine. And also ask them, is it sticky? How sticky is the surface of the PU? There are things that you can do should you already have some sticky PU um, to help the, the fabric glide under the machine and I'm going to cover those later on. Okay, so ironing. I got a lot of questions about ironing PU and naturally some of you might be nervous about it because PU has basically got a layer of plastic on the front and naturally if you add heat to plastic if you leave it there too long you're going to have a horrible melting scenario and that's not what we want but i'm here to show you you absolutely can iron the wrong side of pu which is important because if you've bought it on the internet and it's come in a package it is invariably folded up so you need to be able to get the creases out so i'm going to iron a piece and show you that you absolutely can iron the pu so I've got a piece here, I'm going to crinkle it up, which feels quite satisfying. So look there, that's in a proper creased up mess there. Now of course when you buy your PU, it's not going to be as creased as this, it'll have a few folds. I just wanted to prove a point that I can make this horribly scrunched up PU nice and smooth and looking brand new again. Okay, so I'm going to place that on my mini ironing board. I've just got a normal domestic iron here and my iron has uh, got a dot system. The first dot being silk and for the two dots it's wool and the three dots is for your heavy cotton and linen and um, I always iron with about two and a half so two and a half dots and um, my iron's got auto off because I can be a little bit absent-minded <laughs> so I'm just waking it up now I'm going to stand up and I'll tilt the camera down so that you can see how I'm going to do the ironing. So I've got my horrifically scrunched up PU here. You must never iron on the right side of PU for obvious reasons because that is, you're just guaranteed a melty scenario. It'll be horrible. I certainly don't want to be in your house if, if that's what's happened. Uh, so always iron on the wrong side of PU. And um, I think we're at temperature now. And then when you iron on the PU, you never rest the iron on the PU. You're going to move it all of the time. So I'm just going to go straight ahead. And what I do is, rather than just doing a sweeping motion, I'll do a few sweeps and then I'll lift it away. This gives the, the PU a chance to cool down a little bit before I pass the iron over it again. And of course, as I'm ironing it, the PU fabric is starting to feel a little bit rubbery and floppy. That's because obviously the PU is, well, I wouldn't say melting, but it is beginning to melt and feel soft because of the heat. Don't worry about that. 
when the PU cools down again back to room temperature, it will go back to the state that it was in before and feel stiffer again. So just take as many, you can, you can iron a stroke like this until the cows come home actually. So you can spend a lot of time passing heat onto the fabric as long as you do a few swipes in whatever direction or shape that you want, but you lift up the iron on a regular basis. So I'm thinking, and yes, of course, you will notice a little bit of a funny sort of plasticky smell. That's to be expected. When the fabric cools down again, the smell will also go away. And have a look on the right side. So look, we're, we're almost, if, when you remember how scrunchy and horrible that looked, there's a tiny bit of creasing there. So I'll iron that again just to get those creases out. And the lovely thing about knitted backings is they're fabric, so they're quite they're quite friendly to iron on. So some PUs have more of a, a plasticky backing. If it has more of a plasticky backing, then I would always use an ironing cloth before ironing onto the wrong side of your PU. And in fact, in most of my patterns, I do instruct people to iron on the wrong side of PU using an ironing cloth just because that's the safest scenario but actually if you're careful like this and you've got a knitted backing like this you absolutely can iron directly onto the fabric not only is it faster it works fine there you go perfect all ready for adding your interfacing if you need to which is what I'm going to talk about now. So, using interfacing on PU. Well, the PU that I stock, I think it's durable enough in many cases to not need to add interfacing on your bags. Now, I know that if you are used to using quilt weight fabric or poplin or most cottons, you would iron some sort of interfacing onto the wrong side of your fabric. Um, but I'm saying that with this, you don't necessarily need to. So like I showed you with this grey bag before, on most parts of the bag there is no interfacing on the back, yet it's perfectly strong and durable enough. I have added interfacing behind the rivets because I needed to make a hole in the fabric for the rivets and of course this would become a high stress area. So I've actually ironed some interfacing onto the wrong side of that. And if I was putting in a magnetic snap, I would add some interfacing as well. So how do you go about ironing interfacing onto the wrong side of your bag? Let's have a quick chat about the interfacings that I like to use. So I typically use three types of interfacing or interlining on PU, and I always use a branded one. I only ever use Visline. I don't think it's a great idea to... Um, save money on using value interfacing because it's you can't always guarantee its strength and you can't always guarantee the quality of the adhesives so i i personally tend to stick to using visline it's predictable it always works great it's never let me down so the one that um i use the most probably is medium weight fusible and that is visline 304 it's really versatile, works really, really great. Never looks exciting, unfortunately, but it's kind of papery and thin. It's um, The adhesive side is kind of dotty and irons onto um, your PU very, very easily with no issues at all. If I want something with a little bit more gumption, or maybe um, the fastenings that I'm using are, are really heavy, some of, the, some of the bigger locks look amazing, but they can weigh a ton, I might want to use a stronger fusible weight interfacing and in that case I will turn to woven fusible interfacing. Woven fusible interfacing is brilliant because you can use this stuff on anything from silk all the way up to PU. Um, it's called Visline, I've just written it down, Visline G700. It's wonderful stuff. It's a tad stronger than um, 
the medium weight so it adds a little bit more stiffness and body but it still has gorgeous drapes so it never looks crunchy but it is definitely stronger than the 304 and you just iron that on in the same way um, when it comes to uh, squish so I think that all bags be they really small or be they really large I think it's a great idea to have a bit of squish in your bags and for adding squish I like to use either fleece or foam and I tend to use a fusible fleece because the great thing about fusible fleece is you don't need to worry about it moving around in construction and the fact that it's fused to your fabric also adds a little bit more strength as well compared to using a sewing fleece so I, I never use a sewing fleece in bag making I always use a iron on fleece and this is um, Vylene H640 I think I put this in pretty much all if not most of my bag designs now the thing about using this is you can't use it or at least I haven't with success used it on the back of your PU I've never been able to iron this onto the back of PU and I'm very sure that that's because both surfaces are so porous so when you try and bond them together not enough surface area is bonding and making good contact with each other so I don't try I mean sometimes you can get in a little area to stick but it peels away so easily so I think that it's just far better to iron your fleece onto the wrong side of your lining because in almost all cases your lining will be either some quilt weight or some poplin or some other form of cotton fabric you are not likely to have PU in the lining of your bag so when using fusible fleece use that on the wrong side of your lining works and in fact that's what I've done that's what I've done with this bag so I've just had PU on, on the top just at the, at the mouth because I think that looks nice and it also helps with keeping these rivets stable but anyway I've ironed fusible fleece to the wrong side of this lining and it, it feels really nice and it's really easy to work with. If I wanted a bag with um, more squish uh, and with more protection, let's just say I'm making a laptop bag then and, and I'll, I would head for foam. Um, I really really like this foam, it's by um, Visline and this product is called Visline Styleville. Now I always prefer I always prefer sewing foam because when I've tried fusible foam and I have used fusible foam I often find that if you iron it to a fabric and then when often we're always sewing our fabrics right sides together and then we're turning to the right side I think when you turn to the right side and you've used fusible foam on your fabric I find you get lots and lots of crinkles so I find that sewing it into your seams prevents that so if you want if you want to use foam in your bags I recommend sewing foam and I recommend sewing it in between your um, your lining and your PU outer works really really well okay so I'm now going to show you how to iron let's just say you wanted you wanted a firmer handle on your PU fabric to prevent bulk we must always always as best as we darn well can prevent let's just say we've got a, a, our pattern piece here we do not want to have our pattern pieces with interfacing or foam in the seam allowance so let's just pretend this is a rectangle pouch always cut the seam allowance away so if your if your seam allowance is one centimeter then I would cut away at least one centimeter um, from the your interfacing pattern piece if you wanted to make absolutely completely completely sure cut your interfacing perhaps one and a half centimeters smaller than your pattern piece then no matter how clumsy you might be when ironing your interfacing on you're not going to be stitching through PU and interfacing 
And if you could, if you do that, you'll make life so much easier when it comes to reducing bulk. So that's really, really important. No interfacing or interlining in our seams. So, right, so I've got a piece of um, woven here and I'm just going to iron it to the wrong side of my PU fabric. Just wake up the iron again. And just like before, when I was ironing the creases out of the PU, I just sweep the iron over quite a few times, but lifting up the iron on a regular basis. That's because this gives this gives so you, you're you're using the heat to activate the adhesive by sweeping. And then by lifting up, you're enabling the PU to cool down a little bit so that you can't get excessive heat on the PU and create a melting scenario. And naturally, this will take longer to fuse your interfacing to your PU than you were than if you were ironing onto woven fabric because you can't because when you're ironing onto woven fabric, you press down a weight, don't you? But with PU, you can't do that. So you just, just have to be a little bit patient. And pass and lift and pass and lift and pass and lift. Sounds a bit like a fitness class. <laughs> And there you'll see. So it's a bit floppy and melty, obviously, because the fabric's quite hot. But I can tell you that. Let's wait for it to cool down a little bit more. I can tell you that the woven interfacing is strongly and properly and smoothly ironed to the wrong side with no issues. And that's how it looks. That's how it looks at the front, and there, no no bubbles on the back, and it's stuck on no problem. There, I'm not I'm not able to peel it away with my nail. Easy peasy. Okay, so what is next? So that covers interfacing, and ironing, and ironing interfacing onto PU. Now we are going to look at. Pattern cutting, right, so as I said before, well I don't know if I said this before, when we are using PU we mustn't use pins in our PU because PU is non-woven, it's a, a, a layer of plastic over some fabric, so if we had pins and we were to poke them into our PU pieces, you would be left with a little hole, it doesn't heal over like woven fabric does. So this we 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 need to be able to hold our pieces, our pattern pieces together, and put our pattern pieces on our fabric using things like clips or sellotape, tape, so we can avoid making holes in the fabric. So I, I have a pattern piece here. This is um, for my easy peasy purse, and I want to put it on my fabric, and I want to somehow ensure that the pattern piece doesn't move around so luckily my my purse pattern has a straight edge and my PU has a straight edge as well so it's really easy peasy to get some sewing clips and hold together like that and as long as I'm careful it's going to be very simple to place this on my cutting mat use a rotary cutter and a ruler and to cut around all of the edges and I can just move these clips around as I go as I cut off the edges. One thing I will say about using sewing clips on PU, uh, firstly have you got sewing clips? If you haven't you need to get some. They're handy for so many other reasons besides, besides this. They're not just a nice alternative, they actually work really really well and you need to have some. Um, yeah, so using sewing clips on PU. So most sewing clips have these little nodules on the very tips 
and the nodules are great because what they do is they bite into the fabric and they help prevent the sewing clips from sliding off your fabric easily so we don't want these nodules to indent our PU so what we do is we use the edge we use that we just clip clip the other fabric and the pattern piece on just by the edge I mean and, and it's in the sew, seam allowance so this would have a centimeter sewing allowance it might leave indents in behind but as it's in the seam allowance it's no big deal because you know what I mean it, it doesn't matter so much if you're going to clip the piece then cut and then sew really quickly that's fine but you know what happens you get to a stage where you've clipped all your pieces together you're raring to sew you fire on the machine and then the phone rings and then you answer the call have a lovely chat with your mum or whomever and you come back to your pattern pieces and you find there's these whacking great big nodule marks in your fabric so to avoid that just use the edge okay so that was a word about the small sewing clips sometimes for very for whatever reason you might find that you have to place your pattern piece deeper into the fabric and then your small sewing clip won't reach won't reach the pattern piece so that's where jumbo clips are really really handy so I've got a smaller bag of these because I'm not a quilter per se um, but I find them really really useful for when I want my sewing clip to reach deep into the fabric and then hold then hold my pattern piece in place so that I can cut easily so yeah it's worth investing in you know maybe a smaller bag of these really really useful and obviously if you don't have clips you can also use a cello tape to stick your pattern piece to your um, fabric but then that is kind of annoying though because you end up with a layer of cello tape on your pattern piece and also you have to peel away the cello tape from the um, excess fabric both of which are a little bit annoying so I prefer not to have to do that Okay, so that was a word about sticking your pattern pieces to a PE and cutting. Um, let's talk now about the best feet to use and needles. So um, PU does not require you to buy sharps. It doesn't require you to buy leather needles either, um, which is great because leather needles are expensive they're actually not good for PU because of the way that they're designed. So leather needles have a chisel point which is, decide, which is designed to um, pierce the leather before, before the needle goes in and that is actually quite damaging to PU. So your best needles to use for PU are universals because universal needles are plenty sharp enough but actually they've got a slight ball point which is a little bit more gentle on your PU fabric than a leather needle is so many people think ah because it's faux leather then I need to buy a leather needle that's absolutely not the case the best needles to use are your universals and for my PU I use a 90 weight needle now I prefer a 90 weight because it's got the balance of strength Plus also, because it's not such a, a, a as wide as a 100 and up, they don't leave as big a hole. So I think 90s are great because they're strong enough and they leave, you know, they leave holes which are a bit smaller than your 100s and your upwards. Um, so, yeah, I, I usually buy my 90s by the 100. And for my PU, they are the perfect weight. If you happen to be using PU, which is thicker, um, I can't comment on that, but... Um, I assume that if you're using thicker PU then you kind of need to be looking at 100 or upwards but if you're not sure as usual it's always best to experiment. Um, when it comes to machine feet we do need to use different machine feet when sewing with PU. Um, I always always absolutely use a walking foot for actually almost all of my sewing because a walking foot handles thin flimsy beauty fabrics beautifully and it also handles thick fabrics 
beautifully. It's so, so versatile that I literally use it for all of my sewing. And what is great about a walking foot is, let's say um, the walking foot literally walks across your project. So it's not called a walking foot for fun. It's because that's what it actually does. So it walks like that and grabs and pulls forward, walks and pulls forward, walks and pulls forward. What is wonderful about that is it, it prevents it prevents stickiness scenario. Because it doesn't need to glide on your fabric, it just needs to walk on it. There's far less um, possibility of there being a sticky situation. That's another reason why it's great. And also when you're sewing with PU, PU fabric is thicker than um, your woven fabric. So um, a walking foot will help guide all layers through your machine at an even pace. That's another reason why walking feet are amazing. Um, and also, and also they're just, I just find that a walking foot is ever so slightly slower than a normal foot, which gives you another nanosecond longer to think. So I, I really like the steadiness of sewing with a walking foot. Um, I think that they, um, other feet you can use are roller feet. Um, I have used roller feet before, though sometimes I do find that when using a roller foot, you need to increase the um, foot pressure of the machine for it to get for the for the machine to kind of get purchase of your fabric. But when you increase the, the foot pressure on your roller foot, sometimes with your more delicate PUs, you can sort of end up with a crosshatch pattern from the foot embossed into your fabric, um, especially if you're top stitching, which doesn't look great. So I tend not to use roller feet. You can also use um, a Teflon feet. Um, Teflon are non-stick foot, of course they are. Um, but I find that Teflon, Teflon feet doesn't help with the bulky layer issue that you invariably will have when sewing with PU. So your best all-in-one does everything it needs to makes your life so much easier is a walking foot and I really feel that if you enjoy sewing bags at all or you enjoy craft sewing and you like making home home accessories then a walking foot is your best buddy and you'll find yourself sewing with it almost all of the time. Okay so that's walking feet uh, walking foot and 90 needles. Um, what's next? So sticking to the sewing machine. Right, yes, so let's pretend that you, I'm going to switch my iron off and get my machine on the table. So as I said at the beginning of the film, my the PU that I stopped does not stick to the sewing machine and it does not stick to the foot so if you're using PU from my shop what I'm going to talk about now it will not be an issue for you but let's just say you saw the most incredible pink glitter vinyl and you had to use it and I and I would understand because that sounds beautiful to me but the thing about a glossy vinyl is it's as sticky as beep 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 and we need to know how to cope with that on our home sewing machine. So I'm going to grab my machine now so that I can demonstrate what I would do. Uh, in case you're wondering, my sewing machine is a Shinomri Memory Craft 9450 and I love her a lot. We've been through a lot together. <laughs> so let's switch her on um there are a, there are a few things that you can do and a few suggestions that i've heard other people make uh let's just pretend for argument's sake this is our glossy glitter vinyl and it's sticky and horrible um so actually but this isn't this is not sticky and horrible but let's just pretend it is um we you could put a layer of tissue paper on the right side of your project and then sew it, and then after sewing, peel the tissue paper off. Um, I have tried that once before, um, but I tend not to like doing that because, especially if you've used long stitches, like four and a half, 
uh, you spend have to end up spending time when you peel the tissue away sometimes you kind of have to take it off under the stitches as well which is a little bit annoying slows things down so I, I don't use the tissue paper method um, other people I've suggested even putting um, talcum powder on the on the bed of the machine I I wouldn't advise that because it's not great for um, any dust or dirt to be coming in contact with the innards of your machine so I really wouldn't advocate putting anything like silicon spray or anything like talcum powder on the machine um, it's far far easier actually just to either um, some people even put stick masking tape you can stick masking tape onto the machine but I find the most convenient and quick and least wasteful thing to do is to just use some post-it notes uh, most people have got post-it notes at home um, I usually just use a couple actually so what I'll do is I'll get the post-it note I'll ensure that the sticky end is facing me um, because if you put the sticky end facing you you go in with your project you'll find that sometimes your fabric lifts off the post-it note which is annoying you don't want that to happen not especially when it's all hands on deck and you've got to sew so make sure that when you stick your post-it note to the bed of the machine have the sticky side facing you and I will just put a couple of sticky notes one one at the edge and one leading up to the needle but not under the needle obviously and then that provides a perfectly nice slippery so it's runway up to the needle and then it will help you know and then it'll just help your fabric it'll just help your fabric to glide through the machine like that easy um, and if you're using a walking foot chances are you won't have you won't be having a sticky issue with um, with sticky fabric sticking to the walking foot um, but if you're not using a walking foot then again you can try the tissue paper trick on the upper side of the fabric as well to help prevent stick okay so I hope that explains how to work with stick um, okay so next stitch length so when we're working with PU um, we need to try and prevent putting too many holes close together in the PU because if you don't what you're doing is if you stitch uh, with a normal stitch length of say 2.4 which is the standard for woven fabrics what you're going to be doing is you're going to be creating lots of perforations in the fabric and if you create perforations in the fabric that makes it easier to tear and we don't want that so when I'm sewing my PU I stick to a construction length of three and a half and then when I'm top stitching, I stick to a length of four and four to four and a half. Um, just one note about the top stitching. So by the time we're top stitching, we're probably stitching through at least four layers and it's the final flourish and we're almost there. You're nearly ready to gift your bag. Everyone sees the top stitching, so we're quite nervous about it one really really helpful thing to do is to a ensure that your project isn't going to stick to the bed of your machine or your needle you can easily test that before actually even switching the machine on and the second thing to do is ensure you're using a fresh needle so if if I've been making quite a um, lengthy project for my top stitching what I'll often do is I'll choose to change my needle at that point so I'll do the top stitching and then the needle is still fresh for the next project so for all of the top stitching that I have to do because that's the final stitching I use a fresh needle and goodness me it helps so much with preventing um, skip stitches because everyone hates skip stitches on top stitching me as well <laughs> okay so I hope that explains stitch length um dealing with bulk how do we deal with bulk in our pu sewing so as i said before with our interfacing and our interlining 
you really need to avoid getting any interfacing and any um, wadding or you know interlining in the seams. If you're unsure, let's say your 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 seam allowance is one centimeter, as I said before, cut your interfacing and interlining one and a half centimeters smaller. It will make your life so so much easier. Um, if you're making a strap and you've folded your fabric into four layers, and I will and I will show you in a moment. So you've got your strap here. You're you're doing a book fold which leaves you with your four layers and that's got you a nice looking strap like that. What do we do to hide these raw edges? So what you'll probably do is, what I would do, what I usually do is fold over and, and then imagine that there's a, a D-ring here. I can get one actually, bear with me a sec. Okay, so you got your strap and then you've got your hook and you feed your strap over the hook and then to conceal your raw edges you might fold you might fold one of the the short edges in and then fold it over like that. Now I can say, I can tell you, if you're on a home sewing machine, sewing through that's going to be a flipping nightmare. Uh, I wouldn't even attempt it because it'd just be really frustrating. What I would do instead is just pop a rivet in it. So rivets, rivets are your friends when it comes to thick layers and, uh, and strap making. They're really, really easy to use. You, you don't have to have a fancy um, hand press. You can absolutely just get a double cap rivet. My favourite size is 8 wide by 6 tall. So that's 8 millimetres wide by 6 millimetres tall. Eight, 8 wide is because that looks nice. You don't want a small rivet on a, a wider expanse of fabric. And 6 tall is nice because it's not too tall. If it's too tall, then the fabric is kind of loose and moving around. And then if it's and if it's too short, well, naturally you won't be able to get the cap ends together. So I find that eight by six is really, really great for home bag making. So if you pop a rivet into the strap there, not only does it look awesome. Uh, but it, it works really well too. Just don't sew it. Just pop a rivet in it. Always. <laughs> um, if you uh, if you are wanting to make a handle loop and you want to put that in between the lining and the um, the lining and the exterior of the bag, then what I would do is I would make a handle loop by making a double fold like this. I think what I'll do is I'll make a video I'll make a video that covers PU strap making in more detail and I will actually and I'll actually demonstrate making the PU strap. Um, but let's I'll just do a quick run through. If you're making a, a, a handle loop then I would I would make it from two layers like this. I'd run some ribbon inside because that's going to add strength. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense now because I've decided I will actually show you how to do it in another film and then fold over and then then you can have the handle loop in between the lining and the um, the lining and the uh, PU outer of the bag. You wouldn't want a four layer handle loop because it's just going to be massively bulky and a real nightmare to sew. Anyway, don't worry if that doesn't make too much sense. As I said before, I will make a video and that you'll better see what I'm talking about. Okay, right, so that is dealing with bulk. Yes, let's say another thing, if you're sewing, you know, you might you might be, you might be, let's switch this it's quite glary, isn't it? Let's happen. Ah, look, that's better. So let's say you're sewing, um, you're sewing, and you, you're sewing through a handle loop area. It's getting bulky, and as you sew through, the 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 back of the foot is tipping forward, 
and then the, and you're getting slip stitches what is happening is if you start sewing and your the your your um foot is tipping you're tipping upwards because of there's too many layers under the machine the the machine can't get good purchase of your fabric and feed your fabric forward evenly so before you get sewing what you need is to stabilize this foot so that it's even so if, like I say so if you imagine imagine that I've got 10 squillion layers under under my machine foot and it's tipping the front of the foot forward my machine won't be able to get purchase of the fabric so what you need to do is ensure that your foot is completely level before you start off and that's where something like this this is a machine aid comes in very handy so when you're sewing when you're starting off your sewing and it's a bulky nightmare you'll be amazed you'll be amazed at how helpful this thing is so this slides under the back of your machine foot and it, and it sits on top of your project so let's get so, so let's just do that so there's my pu there and you lift up your foot and then you slide this bulky aid under the foot as far as it will go and it will be it will really really help your machine get purchase of the fabric and pull it through evenly therefore avoiding your horrific slit stitches um, if you don't have a bulky seam aid because you've ordered one and you're still waiting for it to arrive you can use a needle case um, but a needle case isn't as good because a needle case doesn't quite go as far in as a seam aid I mean that's what that notch is for so that notch enables the bulky seam aid to go right up to the needle and um, a needle case doesn't have this notch so yeah I know Becky Alexander Frost loves them and I do too. Okay, so the last thing, the last thing, um, thank you for sticking with me if you're still here, um, is what to do. What to do if you've made a mistake? Ah, you have sewed your amazing bag and your needles have gone, your needle has gone awry and you need to unpick it. But then does that mean we need to throw it away because we've got holes in our project that aren't supposed to be there and it's PU and the holes are just they're there. Well, you don't need to necessarily throw your bag in the bin and jump up and down screaming. Not necessarily. What you can do, especially is if you've realised you've made the mistake soon enough, you can unpick and then maybe swear if you need to, take a deep breath and then there are certain things that you can do. So hopefully you haven't been using really fat sewing needles. So if you've been using something like a, a 90 or at a pinch, a hundred, the holes that are left behind shouldn't really be that big. That helps. And what I like to do is I like to get a rubber. Uh, so I'll unpick the stitches and I'll get a rubber and I will rub the rubber against the holes. Not really vigorously, obviously, because I don't want to make the holes bigger, but I find that that sometimes relaxes the PU back a bit and it helps to conceal the holes. Um, another thing that you can do is if you can get purchase, if you can gain access by the iron, um, add some heat onto the wrong side, that's pretty effective. Being able to iron the wrong side of the PU um, after you've stitched some. Um, wrong holes into the fabric that helps but I know that in most cases that isn't really viable another thing that can really help is using a hairdryer on the right side of your PU so put that on quite a warm setting and then just run a hairdryer over the PU and then sometimes that will conceal the holes I'm not saying that any of these tricks make the holes go away because they are there for good but if you're lucky, you'll you'll find that um, that the, the the heat or maybe a little bit of friction from a rubber will make the PU relax a bit and help conceal the holes. Um, which actually, if you look super super closely, you might be able to see them. But in most cases, you can't. You know, and I and I and I have screwed up naturally on a few occasions and um, 
tried tried one or two of those tricks and found that it has been fine. Right, so I hope that that was helpful. This was a mighty long video, but then a lot of you asked, you know, some really, really good questions. So I wanted to try and cover all of the ones that you asked me to. Um, I can't stress enough that getting home sewing machine friendly PU will help prevent a lot of the issues that you might have had in the first place. Um, I'll mention it again. Please have a look um, at the links in the Facebook post or the YouTube post. Um, their links will take you to the PU that I stock in my shop. It's really easy to sew with. I guarantee it doesn't stick and it's plenty strong enough. And I also stock all of the interfacings mentioned in the video as well. And should you have any more questions about sewing with PU or using interfacing on it that you think that I didn't cover, let me know. I'm more than happy to either answer um, in a comment or do another video um, and like I said before I'm sure that I will make a strap um, a PU strap video very very soon so um, yeah thanks for watching um, it's time for me to have a snack I really enjoyed doing that and uh, I'll see you guys soon thank you bye